So question number one. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. Get into it. How do you value spirituality with your organization? So you want me to respond to these? Yeah, the, these, are, these are the questions that you wrote that you're looking for your reader to respond to, but you're right. the author. And so I need to know what you're thinking and how you're thinking about these questions. Because remember, this is about holding somebody's hand now. You, you, you're right. the master, but right. people, people typically want to have some type of concrete hand-holding experience so that they really understand what it is that you're wanting from. It's kind of the, I'm not even sure what the word for it, from the participants' reflection. Eventually, they're going to get it. Eventually, they're going to take ownership of it, and they will. Um, all of my students have always taken ownership of what I've taught them, right? Yes. But there's a whole lot of hand-holding because what I'm teaching them is relatively new, and it's being taught from a problem-solving case study this is why we do it methodology and right. so in the same way you're approaching your book but you start the book from a, an esoteric experience spirituality is the humanity of what it is to be a leader so mm -hmm. you need and this is me talking to you now one professional to another uh, yep. you need to hold somebody's hand because some people may not and i'm not even comfortable with the word spirituality but i know what you're inferring Mm -hmm. Okay, you're inferring all of the humanity, all of the motivation, the peace, the internal reflection, all of those things that are consistent and aligned with who they are, have to now reflect on what they do. Right. Yes. So the question that you asked is, how do you, Mitch, how do you value spirituality within your organization? Because not every person in your organization is going to value it the same way. Right. So as the leader, how do you value it? So I value it through um, service to others. I value it through um, language. So how, how I speak to others, but also uh, my expectation and standard of how everyone is going to speak to each other. Okay. Um, and feel free to interrupt me and ask questions. I well, value I'm going to listen it to this over and over again because I'll, okay. I'll constantly pull from it i value it uh from a perspective of customer service how are we, how are we treating clients slash customers uh, do we put the customer client before the product or service or do we put the service or product before the customer if we're going to value spirituality in the workplace then it goes back to the old adage the customer is always right and although we know that to not be completely true um, that is a mindset that you have to have in order to place the customer client ahead of product or service. And so, and so in a customer service, uh, facing industry, that looks like we do anything to, to make our customers feel valued and special. And even if that means there are moments that we have to, uh, do things that, we, that are very much out of the ordinary. Um, there are moments that we have to give away a product, discount a product, deliver a product, uh, un unusual to the normal standard. Spirituality in the workplace at a high priority says that's what we do. No questions asked. We don't, we don't rebuttal the customer. We don't discipline the customer. It's like back in the day, you know, people used to hate to return things because no one would take a return. Like you had to sell the store on taking my return or exchange that's much different today than it was 25 years ago um and i i learned that firsthand um going back to 25 years ago when i when i was uh, running the that high fashion retail store uh, one of my first days on the job a lady came in she had a pair of sandals that were very well worn um it was a high brand, $150 pair of sandals. Doc Martens was the brand. Um, incredibly worn. Well, the, the, the leather strap on the buckle had busted. And so she came back and she said, I want to return these. And I said, ma'am, I can't return those. I can, I'll be willing to repair them for you, but I, but I can't return them. And she said, well, I'll never do business with you again. I mean, and we got into a, like a debate, like a heated debate. And of course, I'm 
you know, I was in a little bit of a corner because I had just taken over the store. You know, I was what, 22 years old. I was trying to set a standard. Uh, that store in particular, uh, the last, the previous few years had like 50, 60, 70% loss. So they, I mean, it's stuff was just running out the right. door. Yeah. And so, so anyway, you know, she, she got pissed. I mean, she was mad and she wa- stormed out. And uh, a couple of the other employees that knew her said, man, you just messed up. Like, she's a high roller. Like, she spends money like crazy. I'm like, I don't care. Like, this isn't how we're going to function. So a few days later, my district manager uh, called me and he said, hey, uh, do you know this customer? And I said, yeah. We had, you know, she tried to return these. I'm not going to return them. And I told him, I said, you would have never have taken them because I came from his store. And he goes, well, I don't know, but, but she's pissed, man. Like she came into my store to see me about that new manager in Clovis. And so he was like, okay, let's think about this for a second. Let's, let's use some long-term vision here. Are you better off eating those $150 pair of sandals? Knowing that she's a prominent member in the community, she's going to shop, she's going to tell others. Or are you willing to risk losing her business and probably others over $150 pair of sandals. And the funny thing was his store was located about 90 miles from me. And he goes, now, believe me, I don't mind if you lose her business because she's going to come shop with me. And so I'll take her if you want to. But he said, just remember the shape that that store's in and what you're trying to accomplish. So what he was really saying was, if you're going to function from a true place of humanity and spirituality, you're going to sacrifice the $150 to ensure that you do right by the customer. There's no debate. There's no rebuttal. And, you know, business leaders will say, well, if we do that, we're going to be returning everything. No, it doesn't work that like, like, that's like, that's like saying you're going to get bit by a shark if you go surfing. Like it's so few and far between. It doesn't happen. Um, And so that's where I really learned over the years, that's what I began calling spirituality in the workplace was I'm going to put the customer client first above my product, above anything else. And so when you begin to do that, that's the value system of spirituality. It, it's, and I think I say this in the book, it's manifested through great customer service. It's manifested through a great experience. It's manifested through, um, walking into a place of business or dealing with a person and you can feel their energy jump off the screen or you can feel the energy of the people before you even walk in the store. Um, Another adage I always use is you never, if, if you drive by two restaurants that are sitting side by side and one of them is full of cars and a line out the door and the other one has nothing and a flickering light, which restaurant are you going to go to? It's easy. You're going to go to the one that has all the energy because there's a reason they have the energy and the other place doesn't. That is the value of spirituality. And you're right. A lot of people don't term it that, but that's really what it is because as humans, we are spiritual, connected, energetic beings. Right. And you've you've iterated that before, but the really was the point. And I think based on how the question's asked is how do you value the spirituality and not how you're defining spirituality? How do you, how do you value it in your organization? But that's, those how values, I, that's how I perceived the questions. Yeah, impact. those values have to be proven through action. Like for instance, um, you can talk a lot about mission, vision, purpose, but if it doesn't manifest through action, then you really have nothing. It's, it's like, I can have a million dollars or a dollar, but if I don't spend either one of them, I have nothing. Mm-hmm. I can have a million dollars and not spend it. I can have a dollar and invest it. And I'm actually more wealthy than I am with a million dollars because I never use the million dollars. The leverage is zero. And so I can have values, but if they're not manifested in action, that's really the value of what it means to you is it means more than just definition. It means action. Um, And I don't remember for sure in that chapter, but I think I gave some examples. Like I said, you know, when you have a good experience, et cetera, et cetera. That's experiencing the value of spirituality. Okay. Yeah. Your second question is this. It's, it reads, what is your perception of spirituality and the role it plays within your organizational culture? So do you yeah. want to add anything to what you've just said? Because you said a lot about that, I think. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, my perception would be what I said. You know, we are uh, within our fullness, within our human fullness, we are spiritual beings. Right. And, and, and again, I clarify this in the book as much as possible. We're not talking religion at all. We're talking we're, about the humanity of, of, we're talking yes. about connect, connectivity, connection between we're, two people. We're talking about the moments that, that literally physically take your breath away. Right. That's, and everyone has experienced those. And so my perception of spirituality in the workplace is how can you create moments with your employees and your clients, customers that take their breath away? Right. The things that they're going to remember and the thing that yes. you're going to hold valuable to themselves yes, and the thing that they're going to talk about with others. Right. And because it's a company, it's a business, it's doing, it's, it's providing a service or a product yep. that then is going to increase your value to other yes. customers. The, the more Both monetarily the more and more. otherwise. The more of those moments you can create, the greater your value of spirituality is going to become. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So your third question reads, what perspective do your team members have regarding spirituality in the workplace? So you're now moving from a point of leader to really knowing and understanding your, your team, the people that work. Yes for you, with you, and about you, do you have an understanding of how they value spirituality in the workplace? And then I guess, you know, can you instill that level? Because your conversation then with your, you know, district leader in whatever way, shape, or form that, that, that happens, you know, 20 some odd years ago, you may not have wanted to have that conversation. He wanted to have right. that. He wanted to right. have that conversation with you because yep. maybe, and, and through wisdom, through time, through whatever, he saw the bigger picture. And, mm -hmm. and right now you were just trying to hold your ground and set a standard yep. and not really think about the bigger picture. You know, I'm, you know, no returns. You bought it, you used it. It doesn't work. Buy another one. Yes. But he's showing you, he showed you a, a larger scope. He's saying she, and sometimes it's, it, you know, it's that conversation could have easily been, you know, what we call political, you know, because right. she had clout. Right. She was yep. a heavy spender. She had, she was, a, she was what we call today an influencer. Right. Yes. Yes. Social media influencers. And I don't even like that term, but she was an influencer and yes. she could have re very readily in so many ways um, brought you down. And that's not what that would not have been good for you. It would not have been good for your team. It would not have been good for the for for the company. But regardless of all that. What perspective do your team members have? regarding spirituality in the workplace. So that means you have to have a knowledge of their understanding of what you just said. Um, it's the same thing as business owner slash leader can say, I know my culture, but then you say, okay, I'm gonna go ask everyone on your team what the culture is. Mm -hmm. And in um, 10 words or less, they have to define the culture. And let's see who, because at the end of the day, you can know the culture, you can know the value of spirituality, but if no one else around you knows it, it doesn't matter. It's a mute point. And so that's, that's when a, a leader has to become less introspective at that moment and have a greater vision for everyone else around them. And so the question becomes, can I go to each one of your team members, part-time, full-time, manager, janitor, sales, marketing, whoever, they should all sound like clones when it comes to de defining your culture. They should give the exact same answer. Your culture should be so thick and clear that I should hear the same adjectives, pronouns, verbs. I should hear the same type of language uh, because then that's when you have tip of the spear clarity. And the fact of the matter is I can promise you I could walk into nine out of 10 businesses and that won't be the case. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. It won't be the case. And so what that tells us is, 
I have no doubt that most business leaders know why they exist. I think they lose sight of why they exist, but I have no doubt they know why. It's just often they don't understand the importance of empowering others with that knowledge and the value of others understanding the why, which again, we go to later in the book as well. But that's why I started with the foundation of spirituality. All of these things we're discussing is connecting in a human spiritual yeah. level. Yes. It's deeper than just, here's the job description, do the job, get it done, meet my demands. Um, that is in essence, modern day slavery. I'm the dictator. You're going to do what I say. If you don't do it, I have no room for you. That is, that is not, that is empty leadership and it just doesn't work. But unfortunately what happens with many leaders is they get so overwhelmed and they lose so, so much sight of their original passion and purpose that everything just becomes meet the demands, do what I ask, just get the job done. I don't have time for anything else. Fine, but if that's where someone is, then they've totally lost sight of their beginning, what I like to call their genesis, you know, and, and so oftentimes with leaders, that's why I ask these questions, you know, what, what led you to the place that you began this business, accepted this role, whatever it looks like, hang on to that and you'll soon, soon start to realize uh, that you need to give more knowledge and opportunity to the people around you. And because that's a hard question. How, how do your people perceive spirituality in the workplace? And I ask that question knowing most people won't be able to answer. But I also ask the question, planting a seed that someone might go, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> Maybe we could bring more people to the table. And that's the message through the book. When we get to Culture Design 101, the message, the first step of building great culture is to build a culture team so it's not just you making all these decisions. And so that question opens the book so that people begin going, okay, it's not just about me. It's actually about the people around me, whether that's my employees, customers, clients, whatever. So the because last I could ask another question. I could ask another question. And the other question could have been, how do you think your customers, clients perceive spirituality when it comes to your business? And that's going to a level that 99.9% .9 of leaders aren't even thinking, but it's a level that would change everything. Yeah. So the last two questions, questions four and question five, and I love your answers or your, how you're perceiving all this, but questions four and question five, they all seem to kind of reiterate, they're reiterating, of course, the same theme, the, the level of spirituality and the understanding and the value of it. Because four says, what are the advantages of recognizing the role of spirituality and its play in your organization? And then question number five would, how would you like to grow in this area as a leader? And so yes. um, we don't necessarily have to address five, you know, in our conversation right now, but everything that you've talked about really talks to the advantages of recognizing the role of spirituality in yes. your organization, in your culture. Yes. I, I think when people, I think when people can begin with uh, recognizing the difference that this new philosophy could make, it, it lends to, because this is a pretty drastic change in thought for, I would say for most people in leadership positions. So I think when you can begin with not the problem, but rather the reward, and that's also a little backwards than what many coaches consultants are going to say. You know, well, a lot I want of to speak to say, that before we, before we end this conversation, I want to speak to that a little bit based on something that we talked about last time we spoke. Okay. Yeah. So looking at it from the place of reward. Yeah. Finish your thought. Yeah, it's, it's like, you know, a lot of people are going to say, well, what's the problem? But my thought is, but what's the reward? Like, what could potentially happen? What if we did it this way? What could potentially, what could your team look like? Um, what drama are you dealing with now? And if you tried it this new way, how would it change things? And, and that to me is the reward that, so oftentimes we don't focus on that. What if we tried it a new way? 
Um, it's like I was talking to, I was talking to my mindset coach a few weeks ago, and he said, "I'm not going to worry about asking you what challenges you're facing. I just want us to focus on what's going right in your life." And through the whole 90 minute session, he just kept coming back to that: what's going right, what's going right, and it's it's very similar. And I didn't tell him this. I, I, I need to reach out and tell him. It's very similar to an adage that my granddad gave me when I was a teenager. And he I'm said, get there. That's where I was going. Okay. Is yeah. it the same one that you, we talked about last time? Mitchell? I, I don't know. I'll tell you what he said. Yeah, Mitchell, Mitchell? Don't, worry about teaching your kid, don't worry about teaching your kids what's wrong. Teach them what's right. And exactly. That was what I was going back to. I was going to go back yes. to that very statement because that's what we talked about last time. And yeah. then what ringed in my head was Proverbs 22, verse 6, where it reads, train up a child in the way they should go. And when they grow older, they will not depart from it. Now, I just kind of made that parallel. You may not have, and that's okay. Some other people would have. But the, the, the impact of that statement is still the same. Yep. Drive yep. them in the way they, they should think, what they should do, the positive, how they should react, the good, the right. Don't tell them all the things that they should be avoiding because then they're yes. going to see those things and they're probably going to be interested. Why should I avoid yes. this? So, yes. and I was, and that's exactly where I was going to go with, you know, before we ended this conversation was that very statement. So if you want to go even further into that scripture that you quoted, it's, it's parallel. The, the, the original, the original language of that scripture is actually this. Oh, well, train I up, know, go tra ahead. Tra go train ahead. up, train. I'm still going to use the English, but here's the it, original. Train up a child in the way they are bent. So what that actually brings us to is a deeper layer. And I'm going to relate this to having employees in a second. What, what that actually. Well, this is going to go deep, into a whole nother. I know where you, which I is know okay. where you may be going. And this is a whole yeah, nother like, conversation like, because you're now identifying, you're seeing them for who they are. 100%. And, what they're and empowering one, what they yeah, are. Yes. 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 And we've had those conversations yep. in the past too. And that and, matters with this question that we're talking about with spirituality, because that is a true practice of spirituality is recognizing in people around you who they truly are. And rather than forcing them to do something outside of their authenticity, you're actually empowering their authenticity, which goes mm -hmm. to Mitchell Teach your kids what's right. Well, well, then that lends to the question, well, what's right? right? They're going to tell you what's right by their interests and their curiosities and their questions and their creativity. My children taught me what was right about them. And then all I had to do as a parent was empower what was right for them. Because it has nothing to do with me as a parent, leader, boss. It really, it really doesn't. I don't give a flip what I think is what's right with them. What really matters is their true authenticity. The problem with that is here, here's we're talking about not identifying problems. We have to identify one. And the, and the problem <laughs> with that is that actually means I have to relinquish control of all of my authority. But that may not be a problem. Unless but it you is, hold it, it, it close it, it to the vest. It isn't in practice, but it is when I'm an insecure leader. Right. If you, if you hold that control close to yes. the vest, and yes. that does become a problem. But and so let's go, back to, it, let's go back to reward. That's yeah. the reason to me we have to start with reward because most leaders, again, a blanket statement, but I believe it true. Most leaders function from a place of insecurity because they, they don't know. They're ignorant. They've never tried a new way. And so if you can show them the reward, but what if we tried it this way and here's how things turned out, you actually open the door for them to kind of begin entertaining the idea of a brand new philosophy and the new philosophy is what we just talked about we have all these people you're going to hire based on authenticity and alignment you're going to empower based on authenticity and alignment and all of that is spirituality and practice but when you can do that the reward we know is going to be greater revenue less stress greater passion more opportunity and you're going to have more business than you know what to do with. That's going to be the reward every single time. And so when you can tell someone, hey, I know you're insecure. I know you don't understand this, but just trust me for a moment. If you do this, 
it will change the game in a way you never could have changed it before or manipulated it before or controlled it to before. It just doesn't work. That other stuff doesn't work. And people know it. I, 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 I don't think leaders are dumb. I think leaders are very intelligent. And I think they know what I, what I, what I also think is they're ignorant to other opportunity and philosophy and idealism. Because here's the other issue. And we'll get into this later as we go through the book. The other issue is most people in leadership positions have never been taught how to be a true authentic leader. It's been assumed that they know how to be a true authentic leader. And so if they've never been taught, then they just don't know. And if they just don't know, then they're ignorant of what else lies ahead. Well, school teaches philosophy and paradigms and things like that. They don't teach spirituality and self-reflection and internal processes. So that's no. the disconnect. Yep. Yep. That's exactly right. Yeah, there's just, uh, it's, it's like I was telling my youngest daughter the other day, we were talking about, we were talking about why people have uh, closed-minded belief systems, basically, is what we were talking about. And she had an experience with a friend. And so we were having this deep, her and I have deep philosophical conversations constantly. And so I said, you know, it's, it's a lot like uh, thousands of years ago, uh, some people settled in a little village in a valley surrounded by mountains. And for hundreds of years, they've never left the village. And so the story then becomes, we don't go beyond the mountain because it's dangerous. And then a story comes up that someone once went beyond the mountain and they never returned. So we never go beyond the mountain. What they don't realize is the person that never returned never returned because everything beyond the mountain was so far greater and better than the, than the valley. And if they would have returned, they wouldn't have been able to escape again to a world of vast opportunity. And so you have these people that their truth, their God has become the valley. We can't leave the valley. The danger, the devil, the negativity is on the other side of the mountain. Meanwhile, little Sarah, who decided to have the courage to go beyond the mountain, has discovered a world of opportunity that is greater than anything in the other's imagination. But she knows she can't go back because she's in a, so much of a better place and no one will believe her anyway. In fact, it's become so in, ingrained in their DNA that they might even kill her because she betrayed them. And you start thinking about this and it's like, no wonder people have a hard time raising their eyes and looking beyond the mountain because it's much more comfortable to stay stagnant in the valley and make up stories about how dangerous the mountain really is. When in reality, beyond the mountain is a life more beautiful than they could ever perceive or imagine. And so then the question becomes, do we want to try to go beyond the mountain? Because that's where the real beauty lies. <laughs> or are we okay in the valley? And if you're happy in the valley, that's fine. But there's many, many more people, I believe, that want to go explore beyond the mountain. And I told my daughter that story, and she was like, that makes so much sense. People just get comfortable. And they stop questioning and they stop rebelling and they stop testing the waters to cross the river to get up to the top of the mountain. And to all of a sudden go, wait, our family's starving for food in the valley? But there's orchards and orchards and orchards and farmland and the ocean and all these resources on the other side of the mountain. Yet they're dying in the valley. And that's how I view leadership often is so many people are so stuck in the valley that someone like me comes along and says, hey, there's a better way on the other side of the mountain. Oh, we can't go to the other side of the mountain. <laughs> we can't do that because we've put so much money into our crops in the valley because we're the protectors of the river because we just can't do that because Sarah left years ago and never came back. Oh, yeah, I met Sarah. Oh, guess what? She owns half of the world now. <laughs> she could give you everything you need. I met Sarah. She's doing great. No, Sarah's not. A, that's a different Sarah. And that's how that conversation often goes. And so, you know, it's that to me, though, is the spiritual philosophy of what the workplace could look like, is it's beyond the mountain, but someone has to be willing to go. Yeah. 